So hi, um, yeah, my name is Fosia and I'm a registered health um, psychologist with the HCPC. So um, I was working at Birmingham Children's Hospital when I conducted this research, um, and we're part. We were part of a, a national program called CLARC, so that stands for Collaboration Leadership for Applied Health Research and Care. Um, and we were part of the Birmingham Black Country um, CLARC um, theme two, which was looking at paediatrics, innovations in care and services for children. So that's the research that I conducted there. So I was overlooking on quite a few projects, but this is one that I was leading on. So just to give you some background, um, Birmingham Children's Hospital has uh, one of the highest rates of admissions for asthma, particularly in the heart of Birmingham. So back in 2007, Asthma UK actually named and shamed Hob for having one of the worst asthma uh, paediatric admission rates in the, in the whole of the country. So obviously they were a bit concerned of that and they wanted to look into it. So Hob then commissioned um, a research project that came to us um, as we have a large um, population sample from the heart of Birmingham. Um, and they wanted to find out what the reasons were. So we conducted a review of the evidence base, um, looking at the ED admission data as well. We did that at the Children's Hospital, as well as City Hospital, which is part of Sandwell and West Birmingham Trust. Um, and then we uh, were asked to look into patient and parent experiences. So we did this in a qualitative research project, which then led to the design and pilot of an intervention aimed at preventing admissions. So our aim was to develop a behavioural educational intervention to reduce paediatric asthma admissions tailored to the needs of local populations. So in Birmingham there's a very ethnic diverse population group, different ages ranging from 0 to all the way to 16 looking at paediatrics um, and there's a different needs as well. So uh, like I mentioned we set out to look at the quantitative data on admission at on the admissions um, and what we found was that majority of the cases were of under the age of five years old they were from a south asian background um, and they were one-off admissions so they tend to come in one or maybe twice majority of them did um, so we wanted to look at this further so we did this by looking at our um, qualitative study so the qualitative research, what we wanted to do is include children and parents of children who had an asthma attack with the BCH hospital emergency admission in the past 12 months. So this study was conducted in 2011, so we're looking at admissions in the year 2010 to 2011. Um, what, we, what I managed to do was uh, recruit 25 participants, um, so that was for four focus groups. And I've done research with children in the past and what I've found is, especially when I'm conducting focus groups, it's great to make your links with the schools that are available um, in the area and uh, any other ones that you might have close links with. Because um, you're able to get the children all in one place at the one time in order for them to take part. And also now in the curriculum as well, there's a lot of PSHE and a lot of other lessons relating to health, which is where that you can draw them out and get them to participate. And uh, Birmingham schools also have a list of children with asthma, with, along with other illnesses, so they were able to just target specific children for me, which was great. So we didn't infringe on any ethical or confidentiality barriers. So um, I managed to um, gain children from years 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 from a, a primary school, and then years 7 to 11 um, in a secondary school. So it's also very, very important that as well as children, we also... Um, interview their parents or parents of children of young age because they're the ones who are actually involved in the care and probably at the forefront of administering the care and self-management in the homes. So we interviewed 15 um, parents to 13 mothers to fathers. Now these parents were not the parents of the children who took part in the focus group. So the age range of the children of these parents uh, was between 2 and 9. So this was quite nice. So we had the age range from um, 7 and above in the school um, focus groups and then we had an um, age range of two to nine for the parents and there was a mixture of boys and girls. So what we first did in our focus group data was to, to get them, the children to get involved in the research and to, to feel relaxed and to take part. We got them to draw um, their ex recent experience of an asthma attack. So the drawings from the age groups were three to six. Um, very clear, very descriptive. I didn't realise they were going to be so good. Um, they were able to just, 
um, illustrate how they felt at the time, which was great. And then that, that got them opened up because they started talking to me about what actually happened, what they were drawing, um, why they felt that way. And it was just great because then we got to, um, we had a good flow of focus groups. So, you know, they said how upset they were, um, how they felt cut in half, um, if they were at the doctor's, if they were at home, having a persistent cough, <laughs> having a nebulizer before they had their admission, but they still ended up with an admission at a hospital. The age uh, from 7 to 11 years, um, sorry, the year groups, um, the older children, they basically uh, supplemented their pictures with some narrative. So they were they went further to explain um, their drawings and how they felt. Um, but they had very morbid feelings. They were a bit more clear. They were saying how they felt, right, they were going to die and how, you know, they were at their ultimate low and um, how serious it was for them at that time. Um, feelings of being cut in half, you know, tightening of the stomach, the chest, etc. And then obviously, um, one girl drew um, how she wasn't able to take part in cross-country at PE because of her asthma and how that upset her. So then we went on to um, discuss different scenarios and have discussions on about their asthma and their symptoms, etc. Um, and we came up with three overarching themes. So I'll just go through these now. Okay, so for illness representations, both parents and children identified their um, illness and gave it a label, so th how they identified that they were going to have an onset of asthma. Um, so an example, and this is from a child um, participant, my stomach, my chest, my back, everything just tightened. The causes, both parents and um, uh, children were very clear about what they thought the causes were. Um, so a, f a focus group extract first, ex as an example, when I have like a really bad chest and like have colds and chesty coughs, smoke, um, I've got hay fever so my asthma gets bad with that, dust and that. So parents also had these uh, reasons or these beliefs that, they, that what caused their asthma, but they also thought that it might be something hereditary. So example, but I think it's something that, you know, runs in my family. Cure and control, so they both discuss control in terms of taking inhalers, spaces, um, using spaces, sorry, um, other medications like paracetamols and allergy tablets. Um, but then parents went further by um, mentioning how they understood that it, they weren't able to cure it and it was more about preventing and um, self-managing the disease. So an example, that will be managing it and not necessarily cure, curing it. And then consequences. Um, an example from a child, when you get a chest pain and it squeezes you and it really hurts and sometimes you might die or something like that really bad like happens. And then from a parent, could be possibly, you know, life threatening, that's 100%. So you can see here that the consequences of their asthma they felt were very severe. Care and support, so here parents and children did differ quite a bit. Um, Children only discuss primary care and school. Uh, for primary care, they were actually happy with the support they received, whereas parents were not. Um, so the children, uh, example, I feel like better than I normally do because they tell you how to use things and they check you up. So a lot of the children, because they are um, in the age group of seven and above, they had regular access care to asthma um, clinics in the GP surgery. So they were going uh, very um, often there, having their self-management done, looking at their peak flow, etc. So they were very comfortable with their primary care resources. Parents, on the other hand, weren't. Um, example, because he's, he's, he's pretty bad, so I thought, right, if I go to the doctors, they'll send me to hospital anyway. So I thought, why waste time? Just take him. So this kind of... Um, mirrored our ED admission rates because we saw that a lot of the, the, the high rates were for children at the age of five. So clearly it's because they're not getting that regular access through their primary care resources. And so that's something that came up and it also the parents also discussed how they weren't, um, it was happening out of surgery times so that's why they went straight to um, hospital. They didn't think about re other resources like walk-in centres or out of hours services etc. They just wanted to go straight into the hospital <coughs> which obviously because they believed that it was a severe illness they didn't want anything like threatening to happen. And in school, this is di this differed as well because children d discussed it in terms of who they approach and how they'd behave in school and what they would do, whereas 
parents discussed it more in terms of I'd inform the school if the child were ha was having a bad day with their asthma. So an example of, of children, um, a dinner lady with somebody, a teacher, I tell a teacher to someone, tell my mum. So they were open to telling people they wouldn't keep it to themselves. Um, parent, so I drop him off and I tell the teachers if he needs it after, you know, so I drop him at, at 8.30, if he needs it at 11 o'clock, just give it. So they, they do that, they're all right, they understand. So parents went on to talk, uh, discuss more about care and support. They discussed how they were um, sorry, unavoidable, it was unavoidable for them to bring their children into the hospital, to have a hospital admission for their asthma. For example, there's nothing that could have avoided that actually, because you know, there's somewhere that he needs to be, you know, no matter what I did, his asthma would have not um, gone down anyway, because I tried eight puffs every four hours, and doctor was saying that once you give eight puffs, if it doesn't come down, it's to come straight in. So they were adhering to the recommendations and the information that they had, but they still ended up in hospital. Secondary tertiary care, they were quite happy with. Example, they always do that. I mean, they're really good in that aspect, you know, because they'll give you the leaflets, they'll give you your plan of how to go about it. The, there's what's that site called, asthma.org, something. And then they discussed responsibility, how it was their responsibility or the mother's responsibility to um, take control and management of um, the asthma treatment at home. Me, I control it. Okay, and the final overarching theme was environmental factors. Again, this is a way parents and children differed quite a bit. Um, when discussing home, children discussed it more about taking control at home, whereas parents discussed it more as how their house was an issue. So, for example, a child having the flu jab and making sure that no dust in my room when I go to bed. And a parent, I think my actual house is a problem because I think the house is damp. Because if you come in any, uh, any cold time, you can't stay here. All the time we use the heater, but we still struggle. So when it's cold, he's got asthma, worse asthma. So they touched up on this. And when I looked at the figures, uh, how many parents actually discussed this, um, most of them were living in privately owned rented accommodation in the inner city areas of Birmingham. Um, so the, they were known to the, the council and they were, they were known about the conditions of their house and they wanted to move. Um, so they believe that it, the house didn't cause the child's asthma, but it did exacerbate symptoms. And then smoking. This is something that parents didn't really discuss. Now, even in causal factors, children discuss, uh, mentioned it, but then there was a whole st a section of time devoted to just smoking with the children, which I thought was really fascinating. And they discussed how they would try to avoid smoking because that has an impact on their asthma. So an example, my dad smokes and I have to go outside to play when he wants to smoke because he smokes inside the house and I don't want to get asthma again. And that's really, really interesting because when I did home visits with parents, when we'd ask them about smoking, they would say, no, we, we don't smoke. Oh, yes, we do, but we smoke outside. It's never, never around children. So food for thought, children tell the truth. <laughs> so, you know, it's great to have them on board and telling us. So the data we collected was very, very important because it helped to inform the design of the intervention that we then developed. We used um, a health promotion uh, tool called Intervention Mapping Pro uh, Pro Protocol. Um, and this is an approach to develop evidence-based behaviour change interventions. And they're very good as they are based on theory, um, which sh uh, help to explain how the intervention then works. So I'm not going to go into intervention mapping because it's quite in-depth, um, as you can see from the figure. Um, but the um, preliminary data that we conducted for the needs assessment were the, the qualitative um, research fit in very well along with the quantitative and then looking at um, identifying the risk group and then looking at other determinants. Um, we then went on to stage two and looked at the performance objectives and how we'd uh, um, get the children and their parents to achieve these, looking at the theory, the intervention design, uh, design itself, um, how we'd uh, adapt it and implement it and then the evaluation plan. So I'm just going to quickly um, I'm just going to quickly um, point out one or two things from the intervention design because again the children helped us with this and this was something that we piloted to see how, whether it was feasible to do conduct as part of routine practice. Um, so the first part of it was the parent and child self-management component. 
And here what we did was we worked with the children to make sure that the plan was individualised and tailored to their needs um, and what uh, the family needs were. Uh, and this included a self-management plan, a pictorial version to supplement the written version that they already have. So what we wanted to do is, because we do live in a diverse community, we wanted to break down any potential language barriers. So when given written information, obviously there's quite a few there it's for, uh, with the different ethnic groups. So we thought about a pictorial version um, and we asked the children and parents of what they thought and they thought it was a great idea. And what we actually got from our feedback with them was that even those who didn't have language barriers, they used it as, as a quick reference guide. So it's great for, to use as a resourceful tool. So we designed that with them in their um, first cli uh, clinic appointment with a specialist asthma nurse. The second thing that I wanted to highlight was the video we designed, uh, sorry, the DVD we designed. Now, we were looking for um, clips to help model the correct inhaler technique for children for, with asthma and the sp different spaces, different inhalers, etc. And we couldn't really find anything. Asthma UK do have a couple of videos, but it's using adults. So we wanted to use children. So what we then did was we actually um, recruited some children and we designed our own. So we piloted this as well. Um, let me just have a look. Here we go. So this DVD, that's our asthma specialist nurse based at um, Children's Hospital. Um, we designed it ourselves. It's an amateur video. We didn't have any outside help because we didn't know how successful it was going to be. But we're really, really happy to say that it's something that the children, the parents, the consultants, um, and in general people really like and is now being used as routine care and practice. So the clips are actually available online um, as part of the BBC Clark website. But if you want any further information, I can let you know. Um, so we used, I'm going to play your clip in a moment, once it loads up. Okay, so we used uh, different children of different ages. We used a young Asian boy um, for the under four group. We used a young um, white girl for the under eight, well, the eight, around the um, mid childhood age, and then an adolescent Chinese girl for the older group. So we wanted to get a show a diverse community range, which is what we've got in uh, Birmingham. Um, we used a black Caribbean kid for the introduction with the asthma specialist nurse, um, and we and this was also our DVD was endorsed then by NS. NHS choices because they gave us two patient stories which we also then added onto the DVD. So just to run a clip to give you an idea. Using a spacer with your inhaler helps to get more of the medicine to your lungs where it can help keep your asthma well. This is how to use a spacer with a mask for young children under the age of four. Find a comfortable position with your child. Shake the inhaler and remove the cap. Put the inhaler into the end of the spacer. Put the mask over your child's face covering the nose and mouth. There should be no gaps around the mask. Allow your child to take a breath or two before pressing the inhaler. Press once. Allow your child to take five to six good breaths. If more than one puff is needed, take the mask off, wait 30 seconds, then shake the inhaler again and repeat the process. Use lots of praise and encouragement. Once your child has had their dose, replace the cap on the inhaler. After the preventer inhaler has been given, you should wash out your child's mouth either by brushing their teeth or with a drink and wipe their face to wash off any powder left behind. If a spacer is used, it should be washed before you first use it and then once a month in dilute detergent. You don't need to rinse it and should leave it to air dry. The detergent stops the powder from sticking to the sides of the inhaler, so more of the medicine gets to the lungs to help control asthma. You should have your child's inhaler technique checked every time you see your nurse or doctor, at least every six months, to make sure you are getting the best out of your inhalers. The other thing we did was the, narration, uh, the narrating was by an adolescent girl as well. So everything we involved the children with and we got them to take part in it. Um, and I think that's another reason why they really um, liked the DVD and parents did too, because it was something that they could relate to and they wanted to use regularly. Okay, okay, I've done that. Okay, so just to finish. Um, Children and uh, parent data is crucial when researching um, 
looking at child re uh, children research, um, especially into healthcare, um, and we shouldn't shy away from it. I think sometimes a lot of uh, a lot of us think that they're a hard to reach group, or we can't get them at the same time, or what's the best methodology to use, but in the end, it's with them that we need to work with so that we can pr produce the right research to inform good interventions and well, medicines, etc., to help them and for the future as well. I also believe in using a mixed methodology approach, so using and collecting qualitative data, so it's very in-depth, very rich, um, and yes, it's personal, but you get a lot of good b um, data out of it, and then you can generalise that data on a large sample size and generalise um, and make it more generalisable. And also looking at research now, we are dealing with diverse community groups, and I think a lot of the... Um, previous research was specific to white population groups, so it's very important that we do the research from the start again. And to disseminate. It's all about the children and about the future of children, so we want to share the, our research with others, we want to um, collaborate with others so that we can get the research out there to inform good practice. Um, just finished by acknowledging the funders, so former Heart of Birmingham Teaching Trust actually funded this project. Um, m the rest of my team, so Carol Cummings, who's a um, senior lecturer at University of Birmingham, who's the academic lead, Professor Helen Patterson at Aston University, and then Leslie Barrett, who was the asthma specialist nurse at the Children's Hospital. <coughs> okay, thank you.